Hi everybody, it's Mike. Here's a video on LSAT Reading Comp. We're going to cover some basic reading strategies, some basic question strategies, and we're also going to try a passage and some problems together. So, let's get started. We're going to be covering a lot of material, and so the video is going to be fairly lengthy. Um, and, and so, uh, down below in the video description, uh, you'll notice I, I've broken it into little components and put links next to those parts. Um, so, if you need to stop at some point and come back, um, those can be helpful. And, and also, if you need to uh, jump around uh, for any reason. Um, also, if you would like to follow along with a paper version, you can get one at this link here, which is also mentioned in the video description down below. Otherwise, if you would like to try the passage and the problems that we're going to be discussing together on your own first, um, what I'm going to do is put the passage up for about five seconds, and then each of the problems that we're going to be talking about up also for about five seconds. And you can just pause and unpause and rewind and whatnot as you need to in order to try everything out before we go forward. So, here we go. All right, so here's the passage. Please pause if you want to read it. And here's the first question. And the next one. And the final one. Again, if you would like to work off a paper version, here is the link one more time. We're going to return to the passage and work through it together in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the general design of LSAT reading comprehension and also uh, offer some strategies for how to read these passages. Um, those of you who are familiar with some of my other learning products will probably know that uh, what I like to do is think about all of the different challenges that are presented on the exam uh, in terms of kind of three main categories. The LSAT is designed to test your reasoning ability, your reading ability, and your mental discipline. And when it comes to reading comprehension, uh, the areas they're most interested in are your reading ability and your mental discipline. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and use those uh, to frame uh, some of our discussion coming up. Um, in terms of reading ability, uh, you can really think about it in terms of, of two specific skill sets. One, your ability to understand the exact meaning of the words that are used. Okay? And I think it's really helpful to know here um, that they're not necessarily interested in testing the expanse of your vocabulary. They don't care really how many words you know or how many unusual words you know. And it's much more, again, about how well you understand words correctly. Um, and then the other reading ability that they test, uh, and to me this is, is kind of the main crux of all reading comp, is your ability to recognize reasoning structure. So what do I mean by recognizing reasoning structure? Uh, simply put, uh, reasoning structure is the way that an author has structured a passage in order to serve whatever purpose it's, it's meant to serve. Um, you can think about it as the relationship between different parts of a passage. You can think of it as the role played by each part of a passage. Um, and, I, and kind of my favorite, you can think about it as kind of the reason why the author mentions each of the things that he or she mentions. Why is it so important for you to focus on and understand reasoning structure? Um, well, simply put, uh, at least per, per the way that I teach the LSAT, uh, it's the one skill that is most important when it comes time to answer the problems. Finally, I think it's really helpful to think about all the different types of structures that you can expect to see on the LSAT in terms of common tendencies uh, and then variations on those tendencies. Um, so I think it's helpful to know that the typical LSAT passage will be designed to give you some sort of two-sided issue. It will give you the relevant some relevant context you need in order to think about that issue, and it will commonly present you with an author's opinion one way or the other. More unusual passages 
will vary from this script, um, and I and I think it's it it you can kind of predict the ways in which it, they will do so. Um, they may discuss just a one sided issue. They may maybe offer no author's opinion, right? Um, or maybe they give us a complex author opinion. The author agrees with one side for some reasons and the other side for others. Uh, or, or, or maybe it's a, in a sense a three-sided issue, right? Uh, on and on and on. So again, I think it's really helpful to go into any RC passage knowing what the typical structure is and then when you run into unusual passages, uh, being able to see them as variations on this. Um, so with all that said, let's talk about some basic reading strategies that, that I recommend. First, as we've been talking about, I suggest you focus on reasoning structure. Uh, and a great way to do that is to constantly be asking yourself why the author mentioned uh, each part of the passage um, that you happen to be reading. Next, I think it's helpful not to try to do too much as you read. And um, I, I think a fairly common trap that some students fall into is that they'll get a bunch of great reading comp advice from a variety of different sources, and they'll bring it all together, and, and they'll end up kind of doing it, trying to do a thousand things at once as they read a passage. Um, and that doesn't tend to, to work out so well. So um, I really suggest kind of simplifying things, uh, and again, making sure that you focus on reasoning structure. Uh, uh, and, and don't worry too much about kind of memorizing every single thing that you read or having to retain every single thing that you read. Um, next, uh, I suggest you assess between paragraphs, right? So paragraph breaks are natural times to, to stop and think about what you've been reading uh, and also to anticipate what's going to be coming up, which, which I think can be really, really helpful. Next up, and, and to me, this is, this is the most important bit of advice on this page. Make sure you develop a habit of always reassessing the passage when you are done reading it. Okay? Um, when you think about, say, a, a great movie or a great novel or, or even a great magazine article, right? A, a lot of times, as you're experiencing, as you're watching or reading it, you won't understand exactly why the author has mentioned something uh, or why they have a scene of something. Um, but at the end of it all, right, after the fact, it, everything will become much more obvious, right? Uh, and it's exactly the same way with LSAT reading comp passages. Um, for the toughest ones, it can be really, really difficult to correctly assess reasoning structure as you're reading. Um, and in general, it'll typically be much, much easier to do so correctly when you're done. Okay, so uh, resist that urge to rush into the first problem uh, and instead uh, give yourself uh, 20 or 30 seconds or whatever you need in order to uh, think about the passage as a whole one more time uh, and think about the overall reasoning structure. And we're going to walk through how to, how to do that together in, in just a second. The final bit of advice I have is to use the questions to gauge how well you understood the passage when you read it. Um, as you get more and more familiar with LSAT reading comp, you want to develop a better and better sense of when things are going correctly for you or, or when things are clicking for you. And you want to be able to kind of rely on this sense to know when maybe you've messed up. Right during your read, uh, in particular, you know, you, two or three problems in a row don't go the way that you expect them to. That's uh, often a good sign uh, that maybe your sense of the reasoning structure or purpose of a passage was a little bit off. Okay, uh, and in these moments, um, sometimes you, you want to invest a minute or so to go back uh, and reassess your overall understanding of the, the reasoning structure. All right, so with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. Here is the passage one more time. If you didn't read it earlier, please go ahead and pause the video and do so now, uh, and we'll get started discussing it on the next slide. Okay, so the passage begins, uh, as they typically do, by giving us a little bit of context, right? Um, by telling us w what it's going to be about. Um, here we're told uh, that the web raises some some new intellectual property issues. Um, 
uh, and then and then it moves on to give us two sides of of this debate, right? On one side, we've got people who say that the laws need to be strengthened to protect copyright on the web. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got people who say that doing so will uh, reduce the usefulness of the web. Okay, um, so we've got that set up here, um, and it's often helpful to think about what's going to come next uh, in the following paragraph. Even when you're wrong, um, I, I think it helps you to, to kind of read that next paragraph correctly uh, or more correctly. Um, here we can guess you know, they've just set up this debate for us, so likely they're going to give us some more information to help us uh, understand this debate better, right? So either they're going to give us a little bit more context, uh, or maybe they'll give us reasons that help or hurt one side or the other. Um, so with that said, let's take a quick look. So the second paragraph ends up giving us more context in which to understand the situation. Um, uh, we're told that this debate comes out of the fact uh, that website pages are linked together. Uh, and so when there is copyright infringement, uh, it can be tough to determine who's responsible. Uh, the person who who put up that document or whatnot um, on the web to begin with, or the person who linked to it. And now that the author has spent a paragraph um, giving us more context and setting up the debate for us, we can anticipate that the final paragraph is probably going to give us information that helps us determine the debate uh, one way or the other. Um, and, it, and it's probably going to also involve the author's opinion one way or the other, um, uh, although it may not. The final paragraph begins to answer this question, uh, and so we can anticipate that it's probably going to match our expectations fairly well, um, uh, although it might not. Uh, and then it goes on to give us an analogy where the author states that putting something on the web is akin to recording an outgoing answering machine message. and linking to that thing on the web um, is like giving out the number to that answering machine message. Um, the author uses this to, to then move on to an opinion, which is that um, just as the person who puts up the answering machine message is the person who's responsible for it rather than the people who give out the number to it, uh, it's the people who put something on the web that are responsible for it and, and may be responsible for copyright infringement should there be any, rather than those who uh, link to it. Um, the paragraph goes on to, to give us some additional information, which is that there are already many ways, or some ways at least, in which um, anyone who puts something on the web can restrict linkage to it if they choose to. Um, and then and then finally ends with a, a kind of a clear representation of the author's opinion, which is that copyright laws uh, should not be strengthened as, as they relate to the web uh, and specifically to these linkage issues uh, that we discussed. Again, if you were working on this passage on your own, or if this was the real LSAT, I would recommend that uh, at this point you go back through the passage again one more time uh, to review the overall reasoning structure. Um, but we're not going to do that together here. Uh, instead, I'd love to move on to the questions, and we're going to solve three of them together. Uh, here's the first one. If you'd like to try it on your own before we discuss it, please go ahead and pause the video. This question asks us, which of the following most accurately expresses the main point of the passage? Um, and these general types of questions are some of the most common that you'll see uh, in the reading comp section. Um, before we get further into this particular problem, Let's backtrack a little bit and, and talk about uh, reading comp uh, question strategy, strategy uh, in general. Earlier I mentioned that I felt that 
reading comp was in large part designed to test your mental discipline. Um, and what I mean by that is your ability to stay on the given task. Um, and I think it's really helpful to, to always remind yourself uh, that the question stem uh, is what actually determines that given task. Um, I know that's very simple and obvious, but in my experience, um, the most common reason that students make preventable mistakes in reading comp is because they fail to consider uh, something in that question stem or, or they're a little bit vague about the question stem uh, and being a little bit more specific about it m might may perhaps uh, have prevented them from being attracted to uh, uh, what eventually turns out to be a, a wrong answer that they pick. Um, uh, so again, really want to stress the importance of kind of maximizing what you can get out of that stem. Um, a few suggestions for that. Uh, one, use that question stem to try to get as clear a, a sense of your task as possible. Um, sometimes you're going to be asked to find an inference. Sometimes you're going to be asked to uh, find an answer that represents something that is directly mentioned in the passage. Um, and other times you're going to you're going to be given tasks that that are kind of in between those two things. Um, so again, use it to determine what your exact task is. And uh, next, use it to determine the scope of uh, of the problem. Right. Some problems will ask you about just one word. Some will ask you uh, about the passage as a whole. Next, determine, use it to determine when to return to the passage. Uh, certain question stems will give you information that then you should use to jump into the passage uh, to review the passage before you go into evaluating the answer choices. Other question stems are not going to give you that sort of information and you're going to need to wait to go into the passage to verify or eliminate answers uh, until you get to those answers. Um, so again, try to get in the habit of using the question stem uh, as the tool that helps you determine when to return to the passage. And then lastly, uh, the question stem should allow you to anticipate what you'll see in the answer choices. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it'll allow you to predict the exact substance of the right answer, right? And keep in mind, a lot of times uh, when questions are made more difficult, uh, the way in which they're made more difficult is that the right answer will be presented to you in a less obvious way than, than, than we would like. Um, uh, what it does mean is that you should know enough about the passage and have enough of a head start based on the question stem that you will be able to anticipate certain characteristics about the right answers. Uh, and perhaps just as importantly or more importantly, you should be able to anticipate uh, some of the characteristics of the wrong answers that you're going to see. So going back to this question stem, um, what exactly are we looking for? Um, well, one, we, we need an answer that represents the entire passage, right? Um, and two, we want an answer that's very, very kind of uh, what I think of as vanilla, right? Generalized uh, and, and kind of safe uh, with no specific wording that is, that is really objectionable, right? Or, or inconsistent with, with the passage. Um, what should we expect in the wrong answers? Um, well, uh, we should expect that, you know, because we're asked to find something that represents the passage as a whole, uh, a lot of these wrong answers will be wrong because they, it ju they just represent part of the passage, right? Um, uh, in addition, uh, very often what we'll see, uh, and, and these are some of the uh, oftentimes the most tempting wrong choices, um, are answer choices that go kind of above and beyond uh, what we're given in the text, either in terms of kind of overgeneralizing the point of it um, or overstressing uh, the author's view of things or, or, or whatnot. 
And also what we want to do with a general question such as this one is return to the passage and review it for ourselves quickly um, just to just to kind of remind ourselves of the overall reasoning structure and the main points and whatnot um, before we go into the answer choices. Um, so let's do that together. Um, the first paragraph presents us with some background and also the central issue that's up for debate. Should internet copyright laws be strengthened? The second paragraph gives us some more context, right? Uh, more specifically, the issue is should the person who puts up a document be responsible? Or are, is the person who links to something that's on the web responsible? Should there be some copyright infringement? And then the final paragraph starts with an analogy which compares putting something on the web to recording a telephone answering machine message and linking to that item on the web to uh, giving away the number to that answering machine message. Uh, and then ends with an author's opinion that just as the person who puts up the answering machine message uh, is the person responsible, the person who puts up a document uh, is responsible, and the people who link to that document are not, and therefore um, copyright law should not be strengthened from their current state. In terms of evaluating the answer choices, I suggest that you go through them at least a couple of times. Um, the first time through, uh, you want to focus on eliminating incorrect answers. Um, and you want to be very, very active and aggressive about seeking out reasons why they are wrong, um, which, is, which is different from thinking about why they aren't correct. Um, and, and I hope to model that uh, for you in just a second. Um, and, and then once you're done eliminating answers, of those that remain, uh, you want to go ahead and confirm the right answer. The right answer should be consistent with the text given in the passage, and it should be consistent with the task given in the question stem. Now let's go through the answer choices one at a time. Here's answer choice A. Um, Go ahead and take a few seconds to think through it if uh, you haven't already. Again, my suggestion is that the first time through the answers, uh, you think about them in terms of why they would be incorrect and try to eliminate as many of the clear, uh, of the kind of obviously wrong choices uh, as you possibly can. Looking through A, um, it's got kind of two main components. The first part says um, that the distribution of something that's put on a web page um, is controlled by the person who who makes that uh, web page or, or puts it on that web page uh, and and not by the other people who link to that web page. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's very consistent with what the author said. Um, the second part says that creating such a link shouldn't be considered copyright infringement. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that part either. Uh, again, consistent with, with what the author mentioned. Um, not exactly uh, what I anticipated in terms of kind of what I would see as the exact wording of a right answer, um, but, but I don't see anything that allows us to get rid of this. So, so let's go ahead and leave it for now. Here's B. Again, take a quick look through and see if you can find any reasons to eliminate it. To me, the first part um, is seems just fine, right? Uh, changes are ill-advised, um, but then it starts to run into problems, uh, kind of, to me, with these two statements. Unless such changes amplify um, uh, uh, the exchange of free ideas necessary in a democracy, um, that goes well above and beyond what was talked about in this passage. Um, we never talked about what was necessary in a democracy. So it's an example of, of a passage that, uh, or of an answer choice that goes well beyond the text. Uh, and we can use that to go ahead and eliminate B. 
now let's go ahead and, and take a look at C. The first thing that bothers me about it is that it seems to kind of uh, be focused on a very specific part of the passage, uh, which is the part that has to do uh, with what what people can do um, if they want to restrict access to something they put on the web, um, uh, which doesn't represent kind of the theme of the passage as a whole. Um, and then kind of getting more specifically into C, um, there's some certain parts of it that, that directly contradict uh, what we're told in the passage. Um, and some of you may have noticed that and, and use that to eliminate C. Um, if we just take a quick look back, um, C says that these people can prevent access without inhibiting the rights of others to exchange ideas freely. Um, but the author mentioned um, that this type of solution, w uh, something that limits access, uh, would compromise the openness of the web. Um, so C not only uh, fails in terms of representing the passage as a whole, um, it, it contradicts the passage in t some of its specifics. Um, so we can eliminate C as well. Moving on to D, and again, take a quick look if you'd like. To me, this is maybe the the easiest of the answers to eliminate. Um, it goes well above and beyond what we are told in the text itself. Um, it it kind of generalizes from what we're told to, to problems concerning intellectual property rights um, overall, um, and then and then kind of to pick one part that really kind of clearly allows us to eliminate it um, if one applies basic common sense principles. Um, again, you may think this author used common sense principles in the way he or she reasoned through uh, the passage, but the passage does not itself specifically discuss the usage of basic common sense principles. Um, uh, and, and so we can go ahead and eliminate D. And then finally, uh, answer choice E. Uh, I see a few different reasons to eliminate this one, but but just to highlight uh, just one here, um, a radical alteration of laws aimed at restricting the web's growth. Um, this goes kind of, this is much more extreme than the author's tone. Uh, we're not talking about radical alterations. Um, and restricting the web's growth is, is also not exactly correct, right? Um, this passage is more focused on uh, allowing for the free exchange of ideas. Uh, it's not necessarily about um, the size of the web itself. Um, so we can go ahead and eliminate E as well. Now that we've eliminated four of the answer choices, let's go back to A uh, and just confirm that, that it's correct. Um, again, not exactly what I expected. Um, uh, it would have been much easier, I, I think, a question if they gave us an answer, uh, for me at least, um, if, if they gave us an answer that kind of more directly uh, spoke about not strengthening uh, current copyright laws. Um, but uh, A does represent the passage as a whole. And there's no parts of A that are inconsistent with the passage. Um, and so therefore, A is the correct answer here. The author is saying that copyright laws should not be strengthened. Uh, and what he or she means more specifically by that is that those who create a link to uh, a page on, a, uh, on the web uh, should not be considered in, in violation of copyright laws. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next problem. Here's question 17, and, and again, uh, feel free to pause this if you'd like to try it on your own before we discuss it together. This question is a little bit more specific than the previous one. Um, it asks about documents placed on web pages. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the passage is about documents placed on web pages, so uh, that isn't a, that clue itself is, isn't a huge help. Um, the second part of, of the question stem to notice uh, is that it asks about uh, a claim that the author would most likely agree with. Um, um, so in terms of 
what to look for in the right answer. Um, we actually we know it's not actually going to be directly mentioned in the text, um, but we should expect for it to closely match uh, the information in the passage. And very likely, again, because it's asking about what the author would likely agree with, um, it's going to be related in some way to the opinions the author uh, expressed. Uh, and we know most of those opinions came in, in that final paragraph. Um, in terms of what we want to uh, look out for in the incorrect answers, um, well, it's likely that many of them will mention things that were not actually discussed in the passage. Uh, and so that's a, obviously a, a kind of a telltale sign and, and you want to be on the lookout for that. Um, and the next thing will be that uh, some of the answers will likely kind of grossly mismatch uh, with the author's opinion, sometimes kind of the exact opposite of, of how the author feels about something. Um, all right, so with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at answer choice A first. A states that documents placed on the web can't receive uh, adequate protection unless the current laws are strengthened. Um, and we know this is very much a, kind of get the opposite of, of how the author feels, which is that uh, the current laws uh, don't need to be strengthened in order to do this. Uh, if you want some more specific uh, text to use to eliminate A, uh, we can look right about at the kind of the middle of the of the final paragraph here, uh, and we're told that there are techniques already available to limit access to documents, right? Um, uh, and so this goes runs counter to to what A states, which is that um, the laws need to be strengthened in in order for for there to be protection. Um, so we can go ahead and cut A. B tells us that um, documents can't be protected from uh, unauthorized distribution uh, without without significantly diminishing uh, the the potential of the web um, to to be a widely used form of communication. Um, this answer was pretty attractive to me uh, the first time through. You may have seen some reasons why you didn't like it and, and maybe you eliminated it, um, but it survived for me at least through the first round of eliminations. Um, moving on to C. C talks about how the instantaneous access uh, that, the, that the web allows for uh, makes it impossible to limit access to documents. Um, but we know the author doesn't feel this way, actually, and, and the text we use to verify A uh, is the same text that we can, we can verify, use to verify that C is incorrect. Um, the author does feel there are ways to uh, limit access to documents, um, so we can cut C. D says that these documents can be protected um, with the least damage to the public interest um, only by altering existing codes. Uh, and again, here's another answer that runs um, almost the direct opposite of, of the author's opinion, uh, which is that it's, it's best uh, for the public interest for us not to alter these existing codes. Uh, so we can cut D as well. And then finally, E tells us that these documents can't fully contribute to the web's free exchange of ideas unless their authors allow them to be kind of freely accessed by those who wish to do so. Um, and, and E is a very attractive answer as well. Uh, and, and to me, at least, uh, the first time through, um, so, somewhat similar to, to B in saying that, you know, we need free access to these documents in order for um, them to, to kind of to, in order for us to fully maximize their use, uh, which seems fairly consistent with with the author's view. Um, so E survived the first round of eliminations uh, for me, um, and and so I was down to, to B and E. Um, in these situations uh, where we haven't been able to eliminate all the wrong choices, now we want to go back and look at the ones that survived uh, a bit more carefully. 
and and scrutinize kind of each of the details as we need to in order to either verify an answer as being correct uh, or eliminate one for being incorrect. Um, so let's go back to B one more time and see if there's anything that we can find that is suspicious about it. Looking at B again more carefully, a couple of words jump out as being somewhat worrisome. One, um, significantly, right? So significantly diminishing um, seems a, it seems stronger than what the author mentioned. Um, and and then the second part that's suspicious is the widely used form of communication, right? Um, and to me, um, that's kind of the big giveaway. Uh, if we think uh, about what the passage was really about in terms of of the potential of the web, uh, what the author was really focused on uh, was it being an open form of communication, right? A free form of communication, not necessarily how many people utilized it. So, uh, so looking back at B, again, tempting answer, uh, but the word significantly goes kind of above and beyond uh, what was discussed and then, and then widely used form of com communication. When we think about that carefully, uh, it, it becomes clear B is actually not about the same things that the passage itself was about, uh, and so we can eliminate it. That leaves us with just answer choice E, and now uh, we want to be careful to verify it against both the passage and the task in the question stem. Um, e says that documents on the web can't fully contribute to the web's free exchange of ideas unless their authors allow them to be freely accessed by those who wish to do so. Uh, if we go back into the passage here, I've gone ahead and, and bolded some of the key components that are related. Um, if you remember, we were told there are already methods that are available to, to restrict access to a document. And we're also told that these methods compromise the openness of the web somewhat. Okay, uh, so from there, and not a big jump at all to say that these documents, therefore, because they're comprom because they compromise the openness, they can't fully contribute to the web's free exchange of ideas. Okay, uh, and and so there's the information we need to verify E, and E definitely seems like an answer that the author would agree with, and so E is correct. So this final problem we're going to discuss asks us uh, about the role played by the discussion of the telephone answering machine. Um, and, and one thing I'd love for you to notice is that even though they're asking us about uh, a kind of a specific portion of the passage, the way in which they're asking um, has to do with reasoning structure, right? And they're asking about what role this part plays relative to the passage as a whole. Uh, so again, another example uh, of why it's so important to focus on reasoning structure during your initial read. Unlike the previous two uh, questions we've tried, uh, this one gives us a lot of information that we can use to actually go back into the text before we look at the answers. We know that this question is about telephone answering machines. And we know that it's more specifically asking us about the role that telephone answering machines play in the passage as a whole. Um, so with that in mind, let's go back into the text uh, into where they were discussed, uh, which is right at the beginning of the final paragraph. Um, feel free to pause the video and take a minute to read back through this again if you'd like. If you remember from our conversation, uh, the purpose of this uh, analogy uh, was to help us determine whether it was uh, the person who put something on the web uh, who was at fault for copyright violations, uh, should they happen, uh, or whether it's the person who linked um, that was responsible. Um, so. And, and, and this analogy kind of helped us see that it was the person who put something on the web, uh, just as it's the person who kind of puts out an answering machine message uh, who is the responsible party. Um, so with all that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look uh, at these answer choices, again, with a focus first on eliminating uh, the wrong ones. A says that the answering machine analogy is primarily used to compare and contrast the legal problems created by two different sorts of media 
Um, so presumably those two sorts would be uh, answering machines or, or telephones um, and the web. Um, that's not the purpose of, uh, of using this analogy. Um, it's more specifically to prove a point uh, uh, about uh, copyright laws as they pertain to the web. Uh, and, and so we can go ahead and eliminate A. Um, B uh, is somewhat tempting if, if it, I think if you, if you kind of read it too quickly or, or kind of gloss over some of the key details of it. Um, but what B actually says is that, is that this functions to uh, describe the positions right, taken by the two sides of the debate. And, and those positions are that laws ought to be strengthened versus uh, laws ought not be strengthened. Um, and uh, the analogy itself is, is not necessarily meant to uh, describe those two positions, right? Instead, we use it to kind of figure out which side uh, is probably correct or, 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 or which side at least the author feels uh, is correct. Um, so B does not actually represent the role played uh, by this part, and, and we can eliminate B as well. C talks about how the legal problems created by new technology uh, are not necessarily themselves new. Um, this is not why the author mentioned uh, the answering machines. Um, his or her point wasn't that these are issues uh, that have existed throughout time. Rather, there, rather he or she is, is using this analogy uh, to try to give us some clarity on, on what the right, correct side is on this issue. Um, so we can go ahead and, and cut C as well. Um, D says that the uh, answering machines serve as uh, to, in order to illustrate the principle which the author believes should determine the outcome of the copyright debate. Uh, and this is pretty much the type of answer we expected. Um, so let's go ahead and leave, e, leave D for now. And then finally, E says to show that telephone use uh, also raises concerns about copyright infringement. Um, this is not why the author brought up telephones um, in, in order, or, or, or the answering machine analogy um, to say that there's also a problem with telephones. Um, so, so we can go ahead and cut E as well. All right, so D is the only answer remaining. Let's go back and verify it. Um, it does pretty much exactly represent what the author is using the answering machine analogy for, uh, which is to show the principle uh, which can determine kind of who's responsible in the copyright debate, uh, who's the person putting the document on the web uh, in, in kind of, again, the same way that the person who puts up an answering machine message, as opposed to the people who give away that number, uh, is the responsible party. Um, so D is the correct answer. All right, now that we're done going through the problems, um, just want to finish with a minute or two of general advice about how to study LSAT reading comprehension. I think it's helpful to think about your prep in terms of kind of the, the four different components um, that are up on the screen here. One, you want to grow your understanding of how LSAT reading comp is designed and what determines right and wrong when it comes to the problems. Um, two, uh, you want to develop effective strategies that allow you to read the passage properly and attack the questions efficiently um, and effectively. Uh, th three, you want to grow your skills, right? And I think of, about skill as kind of the ability to apply what you know and, and to apply your strategies uh, in, in real time. Um, and then lastly, you want to develop effective habits, right? So you want to become very, very consistent at using the right skills at the right time. And obviously there's a lot of overlap between um, these different components, but, it, but I think it's helpful to think about your RC development uh, as going through a couple of different phases. Um, one, uh, you're going to want to grow your understanding and, and develop your strategies. Um, and, and, it's, and of course, it's helpful to, to get some, um, some guidance from courses or, or, or study guides or, or tutors or whatever it is uh, that you'd like to use for this part. And then hopefully after you've, you've 
gotten to kind of a level of, of, of comfort in terms of knowing the uh, knowing LSAT reading comp and, and feeling like you have good strategies to attack it, um, you want to make sure to get in plenty of practice in order to be able to grow your skills and, and develop the proper habits. And, and the best way to get that practice uh, is by doing drill sets um, and, and practice tests. Finally, just want to end with some general advice about how to practice reading comp passages and review your work. Um, first, uh, I always recommend that the first time through a passage and its problems, um, that you take it timed and you do it as realistically as you possibly can. Um, and, I, and I think it's kind of helpful to keep in mind that what you're really doing with that work is trying to develop the right habits for test day. Right. Um, so you really want to try to do everything properly and, and everything as you would on test day. Uh, and obviously, when you start out, um, it, it may be very different than where you end up. But um, it's going to be easier to get there uh, if you're focused uh, on kind of trying to do things correctly right from the get go. Um, number two, uh, once you've tried it once timed, uh, next go through the passage again and the problems. Allow yourself to try things again untimed if you'd like um, and review everything as carefully as you possibly can uh, and try to determine for yourself which problems you know for sure you got right, which problems you were on the fence with or, or, or maybe which problems were much kind of harder than you would have liked uh, and then finally which problems you don't know the answer for. Once you've done that for yourself, then you want to go ahead and look up the answers. And, and I think there's a lot of advantages to kind of trying to figure it out correctly on your own before looking up these answers. And I talk about that a lot in, in some of my other videos so uh, and, 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 and study materials and whatnot. So I, I won't bore you with that here. Um, but again, after you've done kind of a lot of that work on your own, then look up the answers. Once you realize which ones you've missed kind of based off of that, uh, you go ahead and reassess your understanding and your performance, right? In particular, the problems that say you felt certain you got right that you missed, um, those are, are kind of big red flags, right? And, and you want to make sure to, to check all of that very carefully. Uh, and then finally, keep track of the passages and the problems that cause you trouble and uh, and repeat them as necessary, right? So uh, tell yourself, I'm going to try this again in a week. Uh, and then I'm going to try this again in a week and so on until you feel like that one passage is a piece of cake and try to master every single passage that you practice to that degree. All right, we are done. Thanks so much for sitting through that uh, with me and, and I hope you found it useful. Um, if you did, uh, again, I encourage you to check out the companion article. I, I've put the link up here once again. Um, the article includes a summary of what was discussed in this video. Um, it also includes uh, the slide deck that I used, um, as well as full solutions uh, for the problems that came with this passage that we didn't cover in the video. So again, my name is Mike Kim. I'm the author of The LSAT Trainer. Thanks so much for watching, and I wish you the best on test day.